Suzanne Craig and Ross Butner are investigative reporters for the New York Times. That is underselling it. They're amazing investigative reporters for the New York Times. They've written a new book based on a lot of their reporting they have published this year uh, called Lucky Loser, How Donald Trump Squandered His Father's Fortune and Created the Illusion of Success. Suzanne and Russ, welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I went to your book event here in, in D.C. It was really interesting. But uh, you've been reporting, for people who don't know, on Donald Trump's finances for years. But you go really in-depth in the book. Talk to us about uh, what, obviously, Donald Trump's all about talking about money. But what does his financial history tell us about him as a businessman? Let's, let's focus on that part. Yeah, I think that was the our big interest in uh, in the, doing this book was to get to the bottom of that. We had done three longer stories in the Times that explored different windows, how much money he got from his father and how his businesses performed in the 80s and 90s. And then again, after the 2000s. But stringing all that together is where you really kind of see the pattern. Um, and I think what you notice is that he's very good at, as you would expect, drawing attention to himself, at selling things when there's things that need to be sold. Often he's drawing attention to things he never does. That's one of the themes that runs through the book is he sort of builds up his reputation by saying he's going to do things that never happen. But operationally, he has difficulties. Um, he never seems to be very careful about the finances of projects. So he regularly spends far more than what the projects bring in. He often says that. And then he needs money from other sources outside of his business operations to support those businesses. And what we saw right, so was a bit of a Ponzi scheme. A little bit. You see like. his inheritance filling in the holes. And then later the fortune from the apprentice uh, really filling in a lot of holes as well and sort of sustaining this image that he's a powerful businessman when he's really having problems that he's hiding from public view. And Suzanne, talk a little bit about how you went about this reporting because you've been doing this for a long time. Right. So, and, and like Russ said, we, we had a number of stories at the Times. There's kind of the three, three big ones. We've been covering him since 2000. It's hard to believe we're coming up on nine years of this, but it says every journalist, I think, covering this guy. Um, and then we decided after the 2020 story, it was a big story we had where we got decades of his corporate and personal tax returns. You know, we found out in that that he wasn't paying much income tax ever. Um, we also got an incredible window into how much he'd made from The Apprentice. So we laid that out and then Russ and I had a conversation and, and we realized we had a, I think, you know, we call it a skeleton for a book, but we really saw this as an epic American tale and we wanted to tell it and we wanted to delve further into his father. We were really intrigued about his dad from the reporting we did, you know, while we were at the paper. Um, and then we wanted to just learn more about Fred and see that impact that it had had on his life and then re-explore Donald's life because I think there's just a lot of misconceptions that were out there. Some of them were laid down by him early on and just repeated over and over and over. And so, you know, when we decided, Russ and I had a chat and, and Russ took a, had very heavy lifting on the writing. He's a beautiful writer. And um, we worked together and I did a lot of the reporting. So we just spent a couple of years just full at it every day trying to get this together. Before I bring in said, talk about the role of father, Donald Trump's father. This is Fred. Um, talk about his role and influence because he was a pretty good business person. In this case, he was as a, you know, as a, not a small time developer, a pretty big time developer in New York, which is a tough market. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's an amazing arc to his career. He really was the self-created person, businessman that Donald Trump's always said that he was. Um, and he started out just building like garages in the up and coming neighborhood in Queens where he, where he grew up. And then over the course of the next like 40 years, he really benefited from some of the big programs, uh, the government programs to solve the biggest crises of the 20th century. First, the Great Depression, then finding building housing for soldiers during World War II, building more housing for veterans when they got out, and then a couple of programs to sort of build up housing for middle income people later than that. And he built up this colossal empire of 10 to 20,000 sometimes apartments that were rentals. He never had one except for a couple outside of New York City that didn't make money. Um, and so by the time Donald joins the company, Fred owns what would be during his lifetime a billion dollar empire of rental apartments. It's kicking off tremendous amounts of cash. It has very little debt. And so Donald has this like windfall behind him to do what he wants. And Fred, it's a really interesting relationship to us, and it's seminal to Donald's life. Fred really puts his full faith in Donald from that point. There were other siblings, two brothers. 
for various reasons, Fred, the older one, falls off the scale, doesn't get his father's trust, becomes an alcoholic and dies very young, unfortunately. Um, and the younger one never really seems to be taken seriously because Donald's already claimed the helm by then. And Fred never challenges Donald at all in anything he wants to do. And they're entirely different. As I said, Donald starts saying he's going to build things that he doesn't do. Donald's not paying attention to the bottom line. Um, Donald's taking great risk, but it's not really with his money. But Fred throughout his life supports him, even as Donald starts to say, I'm way bigger than my father was, when he's only built like one building with other big partners. But it really seems to be a seminal relationship in his life. I have to say, Carol, though, you, you do see it, and in, in, uh, Russ talked about Fred and, and that era where he went into these larger projects. They came out of government programs, and Fred was seen at the time as taking advantage of them and exploiting loopholes. And, you know, there's, there was an article in, the, in one of the Brooklyn papers that, that ultimately called him a pariah feeding off government largesse and gouging his tenants. So you see shades of sort of what the practices that Donald oh, is accused of. Yeah, racism also. I'm yeah, in, in, in some respects, but, but a great builder. Mm -hmm. So there's contradictions in there. Right, right. No, always yeah. a malevolent force. Scott, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, nice to meet you. So the data that I've seen is that from the 70s to the 90s, when his dad ultimately passed away, he inherited, he inherited approximately 413 million is the number that sticks in my mind. And if that were invested in just an S&P index fund, it would be somewhere, depending on the returns worth today, somewhere between 10 and 20 billion. And it's very hard to nail down his actual net worth, but we know it's less than that. We know if he just stuck it in an index fund, he'd be worth more money. Which businesses have been the most successful and which have been the least successful that he's been engaged in since inheriting that money? I got to imagine the casinos and the golf courses have not paid off, but The Apprentice was a big deal. What else has made and lost him money? It's a great question. I'm so happy that you remember that number because that was on a spreadsheet on my screen for about a year and a half. We were all coming up with the numbers to get to that 413. Um, and, and you're right. That's the way we've kind of looked at his wealth and his general success is that, you know, if he had just invested it and gone sailing, he'd probably be infinitely more wealthy than he is now. Um, I mean, on The Apprentice, look, all he did was show up there. Mark Burnett had, the producer had made this deal with NBC that he would get half or he would get all of the product integration money. And it wasn't really product integration. Each show was a commercial for whoever sponsored it. And they didn't know, NBC didn't know at the time what that was going to be worth. Um, it took about a year to get it going, but pretty soon companies were paying one, two, three, four million dollars to be on each episode. And Burnett, in order to persuade Donald to join that effort, who he thought was really busy, promised to give him half of whatever that would, 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 would raise. And so that became just a huge windfall in his life, about $200 million. And then there was a string of licensing deals that as soon as he became famous, flowed from that. Early on, the year before, he had tried to get licensing deals and he had literally been laughed out of offices. As soon as The Apprentice starts, they just start pouring in the door. Eventually, that goes bad. You see Trump University and all these developments that don't happen because he's not really doing due diligence. But still, over the course of the years of The Apprentice, that generated another $200 million. But when you look at the businesses that he created in that window, um, we see a lot of like alligators. The Chicago Tower, he secretly declared worthless on his tax returns while he's telling the world it's hugely successful. The retail part of that tower was built below grade, so there's no street traffic. It's been empty now for, I think, 15 years. His UK golf courses have continued to suck money and require influx of cash. The old post office, the same problem that, right, he built that thing and, and he spent too much on it. All his competitors knew he was spending too much on it. And we saw in his tax returns, he was having to put seven to $10 million a year into it, which we presume came from the easy money he was getting from The Apprentice and from licensing deals. So golf has been a mixed bag. Real estate's been a mixed bag a little bit. Uh, 40 Wall Street, for example, has been up and down at different times. Um, but overall, like the, the line that's stuck in my head on this is that the less involvement he has in designing and operating a business, the greater its chances of financial success. So talk a little bit about this, this, Suzanne, this idea of wealth and success, how he put this out as sort of using creative accounting, using various task codes and rules to his advantage, 
not something other people don't do, and he actually brags about it. Why shouldn't I take advantage of it? So can you talk a little bit about what, how he does that and creates these faux, um, faux ideas that he's rich? He just says it, right? I mean, it doesn't... Well, I think that what a great... Yeah, because there's, there's, of course, the use of the tax code. But I think when I think about that question, when you first said it, I think about just this crazy image that he projects that's not backed up by reality. You look at... One of the things I always remember about the book was when we got, um, or just the project, it was we got it before we started the book, we got 10 years of tax records from 1985 to 94. And in that was, of course, the year he wrote Art of the Deal. And we were thinking, well, there's maybe going to be some good news in there. That year, he's writing a book saying he's this master deal maker, and he lost $45 million and change that year. So behind the curtain, that's what's going on. And in that decade, we actually were able to find out, because we got some anonymized taxpayer data through the National Archives in Washington, we were able to go in and compare his taxes for that decade to a huge number of other taxpayers. And in that year, it looked like he lost more money than any other single American taxpayer. But what he did, this is like the interesting part of how it started, is he was able to identify, I think really in, in the 80s, I mean in the 70s he was spinning the story that he was richer than he was, but then he fell in with not just the Larry Kings of the world who, where he was able to get on CNN and repeat it, but wealth porn sort of took off in the 80s, and you saw him on shows like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach. And, and he had he had the accoutrements of success. So he's flying around in his helicopter. He was on his yacht. He was losing a lot of money. We, we know that now from his taxes. But they loved him. And, and not a lot of really rich people wanted actually to be on that show because it's sort of tacky. But but he was all in. And it, it, and it perpetuated this idea that he was rich. And then he was getting on the rich lists and all that. I mean, it really did feed on itself. But he started in the early 70s by lying about his wealth, famously to the New York Times, saying he was worth a couple hundred million dollars. Actually, his dad was. And then it just rolled up and kept the number kept getting bigger and bigger. One of the things I really appreciate about, appreciate about your work is that you both really did the work. Reading through uh, some of your work, I just can't imagine how much time you were in a conference room with bad coffee trying to string together tax filings <laughs> and really <laughs> connect the dots. Really do appreciate that you did the work. And also that the New York Times would support you or support provide you with the resources to do that kind of in-depth work. My question is around Donald Trump media. 80 million shares, 23 bucks a share, you know, one, whatever is that, 1.84 billion worth of, of value in those shares. My understanding is he hasn't sold any, and that would come up on a filing if he had sold them. But if I were him... I would be writing calls, I'd be doing prepaid variable forwards, I would be borrowing on margin like crazy to diversify. Do you have any sense of or any evidence around what he is doing to diversify, that shares. monetize the, those shares? Uh, uh, but you left out run by that well-known tech executive, uh, Devin Nunes, but go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Let me just tell you, this podcast makes more money by far than than. Yeah, Trump media. I, I think Go in ahead. a story, I uh, this is Russ's favorite. I, talk. I, I think run, run, run. This is it's his favorite thing. Question. Well, I, I think in a story, I compare their revenue does not compare favorably to a single Chick Fil A restaurant, right? They're mm -hmm. they're they really or a McDonald's. They're it's just not a real company. You said a company. shoe store once, yeah, too. it's not a real company. <laughs> and they don't really have a business plan that makes sense. They're going to stream videos that are available for free elsewhere on their platform because they're at risk of being shut down. But to answer your question, Scott, I, I don't have any intelligence on other ways he might be trying to monetize those shares at this point. I think it's an excellent question. I don't know that there's any way to, certainly no public way to see that right now. Um, but, you know, we'll be trying mm -hmm. to watch out that for that. And if you see any hint of it, please let us know. Yeah. <laughs> we may be sifting through court filings one day looking be. for what you he's done. You absolutely yeah. will be. Also yeah. on the crypto, the sneakers, whatever you have. That's one of the great things mm -hmm. here, so many court filings. Uh, anyway, once yeah. again, the book is Lucky Loser, How Donald Trump Squandered His Father's Fortune and Created the Illusion of Success. I took it home. I read it. It's so good. It's, I, it, I love accounting. Mm -hmm. I hate to tell you, but I love accounting. But this is a really great reporting accomplishment that you two have done. And I'm, uh, I, I'm excited to see more, even though I'm not excited to see a grifter continue to grift. But you've done a great job.